The problem of having a four-hour meeting is that people will die. If you have a break, it's very difficult to get people calm. Some people leave some stay and so on. So you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, good afternoon. I'm Hale Svandiari. I'm the director of the Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholar. It's a pleasure and privilege to uh, moderate the second panel of Al Jazeera English in Southeast Asia prospects and the impact. Um, uh, we will uh, follow the program with one exception that because Roland Schatz could not make it to the previous panel, so we will start with him. I'm going to make a brief uh, introduction of uh, my panelists and then follow uh, the program and we leave uh, the Q&A uh, for the end and uh, we would appreciate it if our speakers would slightly cut down their presentation to maybe 12 or 13 minutes to leave enough time for uh, Q&A and uh, uh, someone found this in the aisle if it belongs to any of you please come and get it from me after the meeting is uh, over. Uh, Roland Schatz is the president of Media Tenor International, a strategic media intelligence organization that specializes in international media content analysis on a continuous basis and that researches and tracks emerging media. Uh, Mr. Schatz has a background in journalism, having worked at the German newspaper Braunschweiger Zeitung and Freiburger Nachrichten. He has authored several publications on the media's effect on elections and public opinion. Veronica Pedrosa is a presenter for Al Jazeera English at the Kuala Lumpur Broadcast Center. She's a journalist with 15 years of international news experience. <clears throat> Ms. Pedroza came to AGE from Asia-based position with CNN International. Earlier in her career, she was with BBC World Television and BBC World Service Radio in London, where she presented news bulletin and feature programs, including The Week and Asia Today. Sean Powers is a research associate at the Center on Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California and a PhD candidate at USC Annenberg School for Communication. His research interests focus on the use of media in times of war and cultural disagreements and international tensions. Atria Rai Tene is a new is a news producer with Trans TV, one of Indonesia's major television stations. Um, Ms. Tenet's journalism career in Indonesia extends over more than 12 years and includes positions with three national television stations and Antara, an Indonesian news agency. Finally, our last speaker is Marwan Kredi, who first of all is a friend and former colleague, a former fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He's an associate professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a scholar of global communication and an Arab media expert. He was previously, as I said, a Wilson Center fellow and is the founding director of the Arab Media and Public Life Project at American University. And I think I'll stop at that and turn the floor to Roland Schatz, please. Normally I would have at least have shaved or changed, but um, as 
Delta and the other airlines who helped me to come from Bahrain here to Washington were not as accurate as planned. Uh, you have to take me as I am. Um, <coughs> I try to run you through some results um, we were analyzing over the last um, months, trying to help um, giving you a better understanding whether or not Al Jazeera English has an impact in Asia and um, to understand why their impact, as my slides will show, is no longer that strong. If I can start, um, it's one way of measuring impact is trying to find out do Asian journalists quote Al Jazeera or CNN or BBC or just other media? Are journalists from Al Jazeera English comparable to BBC or other TV networks? Are they agenda setters? Are there certain news within the news who are so important that the colleagues from, whether it is Hindu, Hindustan Times or Times of India or Malay Mail, whether or not these Asian media are on an ongoing basis quoting news from the different TV networks? And as you can see, other media play a role in the Asian media. You can see there are lots of quotations. But if we try to look more in detail, is Al Jazeera English or is Al Jazeera at all a main source of these quotes? You can easily find there are others who seem to have more newsworthy content for the Asian media than Al Jazeera has. You might recall 2004, 2003, where Al Jazeera was among those who were quoted most, mainly because they were releasing bin Laden videos. So it was not on an ongoing basis, week by week by week, that journalists would pick up stories from Al Jazeera. But here came the video, quotes everywhere, and then over months, hardly any quotes, and then the next video would come. So the question is, why is Al Jazeera, as a source for news, no longer that strong than it used to be? By finding an answer, we try to look into the content. And as you can see here, on one hand, on the left side, you can see the original, the Al Jazeera Arabic program in the breakdown, how much focus of all news is based on business or on domestic policy, on foreign affairs, on terrorism, etc. And in the center, you see Al Jazeera International or the English program, the English version of Al Jazeera. And then as a com comparison, we picked Malay TV. And you can easily see that the slice in terms of terror is the biggest one within the Al Jazeera English news. It's four times stronger than in the original Al Jazeera Arabic. It's one of the results we presented one year ago when we launched the Arabic Institute at Emory University that Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic, they have the same name, but that's about it if you try to compare it. Which is not that surprising if you look at Wall Street Journal, American version, and Wall Street Journal, European version. Again, the same name, but it's not always the same content. But here, if we try to find out whether or not Al Jazeera International has a strong impact on the Asian market. Are they influencing our colleagues in Asia? Here is one of the first answers, maybe why not? Because if I break these topics um, down into details of all these topics, 
among the top five topics on Al Jazeera International, you have terrorism, you have accidents, catastrophes, conflicts on an international basis, um, the Middle East conflict. This is something which seems to not fit as good as other news providers like BBC or others um, who offer at the same time news to the Asian media. If we now go more in detail and try to understand why is it, from a background perspective, the Asian media are, from what we know and what we understand, the least or the less ones who are focusing on conflict, who are one-sided or negative-driven. Asian media like to do what my grandfather already told me, just present the news but don't take a stand. Don't try to be so negative on one side or the other. It's just not the Asian way. And as it is not the Asian way, logically, the media, the Asian media, are not selecting their news according to this news selection. So if you look into the news selection coming from Al Jazeera International and you see this very strong negative approach within the news selection, you can understand maybe a little bit better why they are communicating to a certain region but the ears of these regions, the eyes of the regions, they seem to are different. It's not a program made for Asian, the Asian market overall. If you look at the country focus, one can say, at least in regards to the country focus, Al Jazeera International has a strong focus on what's going on in Asia. So this is not the point that they would focus on events in Palestine and Israel and therefore they are not picked up in the Asian media. With a percentage of almost or more than every fifth story on air in Al Jazeera International focusing on events in Asia, from this point of view, Al Jazeera International's offer seems to be okay. But as I said earlier on, what they have on air, what they select, this focus on catastrophe, accidents, terrorism, this seems to not fit to the interest of Asian media. That's what I wanted to share with you as a little insight from our work and Thank you, and I hope it can be a starting That's point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, probably we had a lot of questions to ask you. Thanks. Um, our uh, next speaker is Veronica Pedroza. She's um, yeah, and she's going to talk about working for Al Jazeera, the realities, and you may want even to comment on some of the things that Sure. Said. Yes. Please. Yes. Uh -huh. um, well, thank you very much, first of all, to everyone who's here and to the Woodrow Wilson Center for hosting the event. I'm very grateful to have the chance to explain what it is we actually do at Al Jazeera English in Southeast Asia and around the world. I was very conscious of the fact that the channel's not available here, though we do get good numbers of people viewing our reports on the website, as Will pointed out earlier. Um, and that's part of the reason why I called this paper Working for Al Jazeera the, Al the Realities, because I think that there are people who may have succumbed to myths about Al Jazeera without actually having had the chance to watch it and judge for themselves. So I thought I would just take this opportunity to explain what we're trying to do, show a couple of our reports and tell you about some of the reaction we've had in the region. Um, I haven't done that kind of um, empirical analysis that Roland um, just showed you, but what I'm going to do is talk about actual kind of responses we've had to particular reports that we've aired. Um, but I, I did want to go back to some, to some of the origins of the editorial agenda that um, Trish mentioned a bit earlier. It's a very early example of how it's developed. Um, you will probably remember the images of a blonde, carefully manicured, world-famous pop star emerging in a small orphanage in Mali to collect a boy she wanted to adopt. 
but last-minute difficulties came up and the father said he didn't want to give the boy up after all. While the agencies had sent crews to cover Madonna's travails, so pictures were no problem, the story was. Several of our journalists in an editorial meeting wanted to run it, packaging the agency's pictures. Why not? Madonna sells, and don't all the international news channels use exactly this kind of story as an excuse to mention Africa's plight? No, if we're going to do this story, then we should do it properly, thundered Trish Carter. Send a reporter to do an in-depth series about what the situation is really like in Mali. Well, it was a moment of clarity for me. Uh, Al Jazeera does not need any reason to mention any story, except if the fully considered answer is yes to the question, is it news? That's a fundamental question that we do continually ask at Al Jazeera English when considering whether or not to cover anything. In an industry where all too often journalists are covering stories about celebrities or shocking but localized crime and the latest technology gives anyone the ability to record an event and upload it for all the world to see, this has meant that we've found ourselves reporting on issues that may not get us more ratings or more advertising sales, but which really affect ordinary people and to which we strive to provide context. And I think that it's the role of journalists to bear witness Journalism should provide a check and balance on people in power, in business, in banking, in aid organizations, and in politics. The check and balance isn't from providing opinion, it's from witnessing events and reporting the truth. Now, bearing witness can be an exceptionally risky business. Who's going to take those risks in these heady days of cyberspace, and who do you trust to report without bias when they do? It's hard to be unbiased in the middle of things, but that is the job of the journalist. I think it's important in the age of what's come to be known as citizen journalism, which I think several of our speakers spoke about earlier, to go a little further. Nowadays, anyone, you, me, my nine-year-old son, could be at the scene of a news story when it happens. Remember that amazingly powerful image of a firefighter bearing the limp body of a small child from the rubble of the daycare center that was destroyed in Oklahoma City when a federal government building was bombed in 1995. It was taken by a bystander. But that doesn't make him or her a journalist. As well as bearing witness, journalists should provide context, tell the wider story, provide balance, and are fair and accurate. I'll get back to these ideas of what I think it means to be a journalist now. But first, let me talk in more detail about what we're doing in Southeast Asia. Um, the decentralized nature of AJE is designed to provide in-depth local knowledge. In Southeast Asia, we've chosen to commission extensive coverage of neglected stories like the food shortage in West Timor, protests for electoral reform in Malaysia, plight of Hmong tribes in Laos, the conflicts in the southern Philippines, southern Thailand, the suffering of people in Myanmar. Such stories are considered expensive, difficult, and even dangerous to cover by other international news channels with more centralized structures. In November last year, Michael and Paul, there were mass demonstrations in Kuala Lumpur to call for electoral reforms. One of our correspondents reported from the scene. If you this mind is playing. democracy, Malaysian style. <laughs> Riot police surrounded the protesters and moved in with water cannons, dumping their chemical load. Police have just sprayed chemicals on the entire crowd. This was, until a few moments ago, an entirely peaceful protest, but they've just come along and sprayed chemicals into the faces of hundreds and hundreds of protesters. Thousands ran into Masjid Jamek, one of Malaysia's most historic mosques. They screamed for open democracy and emerged again defiant. They screamed for open democracy and emerged again defiant. Do you, do you think the people are afraid of the authorities? They are not afraid. That I can assure you. Defiance was met by shots of tear gas. This rally was organized to demand free elections, a contentious issue in this country, which has had one party in power since independence. That ruling party, UMNO, said the protest was illegal. Of course, if there is a clash, and then of course uh, people are not, will not be very happy. The Malaysian Prime Minister. That is the thing that we try to avoid. That's why we say that uh, if you want to have, uh, you have to get in, get a peaceful. 
Elections are widely expected to be held early next year, but today Malaysia's democratic values were truly tested. Hamish MacDonald, Al Jazeera, Kuala Lumpur. Well, soon after that report was aired, the Malaysian information minister called us up in a fury at our coverage. When I say soon, I mean in a matter of hours. Um, we explained that we had tried 22 different government officials to try to get a comment to provide their view, but none had agreed. So would he now go live on our show that was on air at the time to explain the government's actions? Well, here's what's happened. So these clips are very close and they're on different DVDs, so I think I'm, poor Paul is <laughs> trying to line that up for us. There she is. Joining us now on the phone is Malaysia's Information Minister Zainuddin Maidan. Many thanks for joining us. Those were very violent scenes that we saw earlier today. How can you justify the strength of your response to peaceful protests? There, there is a, your interpretation is a violent. It's not violent. You are a man, you are a you are your journalist trying to project to exaggerate more than what actually happened. That, 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 that's it. We are laughing at the... the uh, I congratulate your journalist behaving like an actor, a very As you actor. say that, sir, we're watching scenes of protesters no, being watching. sprayed by chemical-filled water. You have been trying to do, this, to do it everywhere, but in Malaysia, people are laughing at you, you know. We know our police at last, our police have, have, uh, what, have allowed the procession to go to, to Istana Nagara, you know. Though police, first police might be handle them with a spare gas, people, police don't, don't, don't fire any, anybody. Our correspondent came back you, you into are, our office, sir, with you are, you chemicals are, idea, in his you, eyes. You are trying to project what is in your mind. You think that we, Pakistan, we are Burma, we are Myanmar. You know, that's in your, your thinking. Well, we unfortunately, are we are totally when you different. refuse to let people yeah, we protest, are not, not it like does you. appear so. Have a, you have an early perception. You come here, you want to project us like an undemocratic country. This is a democratic country. So right? why can't people protest then if it's a democratic yeah, people country? Protest, people do, but they protest. We are allowing protest. And they have demonstrated. But we just try to disperse them. And then later they, dis they, they don't disperse. But later the, our police compromise. That has compromised and allowed them to go to Eastern Algara. Police, Our police has succeeded in handling them gently. Right? Why don't you report that and you take the opposition, someone from the opposition party, you ask him to speak. You don't take from the government. Right. Why did you not break up these protesters more Pardon? peacefully? Pardon? Why Pardon? did you not break up these protests more I peacefully? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Why did you not break up these protests more peacefully? No, we, we are. We, this protest is illegal. We don't want to, this is normally... Okay, so let me return to my former the, question. Why you know, is hello? the protest illegal? Yeah, it's an illegal protest because Why? we have the election in Malaysia. It's no, no point of having a protest. We are allowing, we have every election, every five years, never fail. They're not like Myanmar, not like other countries. Right? And you are helping this. You, Al Jazeera, also is helping this, this process. The, you know, these process who are not impatient, who don't believe in democracy. Okay. Right? Many thanks for joining us. Al, yeah, you are Al Jazeera. This is the Al Jazeera attitude. Right? Thank you. Um, well, that short clip became the water cooler story of the week. Everyone seemed to be watching Al Jazeera because none of the local or international networks showed those kind of pictures of how the demonstration was broken, broken up. Um, only the views of the government at carefully choreographed news conferences were run. Indeed, the next day, the information minister followed up that interview with a news conference to denounce Al Jazeera for not understanding Malaysia's culture, even for being a Western media organization. Actually, that reminds me of something that Roland was talking about earlier. It's not the Asian way. I always, something happens in my brain when culture is defined as what you shouldn't do. I find that very interesting when it's used in that way. Anyway, you know, 
The truth was in the pictures. Jazeera was on the lips of many Malaysians in those days as the only broadcast source of real reporting on the protests. Apparently, the editors of the local newspapers had even met with the government to tell them that it was very hard for them to put out farcical non-reports about those Bursi protests, as they were known, when Jazeera was going out to every Astro household showing what really happened. Elections were held in Malaysia five months later in early March. The information minister was among many in the ruling party who lost his seat in parliament. The ruling party lost its two-third majority in parliament and is in disarray. I'm going to move on to Indonesia. Just shout if I'm going way over. <laughs> in, it, it is being, Al Jazeera English is being closely watched in Indonesia by the authorities and by the media, according to our correspondent, Step Varsen. She says also more and more ordinary people are watching us. Uh, for the first time, people in Indonesia can frequently watch stories about their own country on an international channel, and they really appreciate it. CNN still doesn't have a correspondent there, and BBC doesn't have a cameraman. Um, her bureau is putting out three stories a week, while in the same time you would only see news from Indonesia on CNN and BBC if there was a disaster or anything big. Now, Indonesians hear about the food crisis, disaster preparedness, corruption, poverty, and so forth in a different way, different than what they see on the local channels. Officially, there is press freedom now, but in reality, most Indonesian channels still shy away from tough questions or critical reporting. There's still a lot of self-censorship. One example was when Suharto was dying. Steps says she received a lot of positive comments then from Indonesians for the tone of the report, which they considered more balanced than that of Indonesian channels. Um, she spoke about that with Indonesian editors, and they all complained that they were not allowed to really criticize Suharto in their reports. What they saw on Indonesian TV were stories of Suharto's health conditions only, weeks in a row. Well, um, Steps says she hasn't seen examples of Indonesian channels following the Al Jazeera example, but she's sure that Al Jazeera has had an impact and that the authorities are not always happy. In the first year, she says she received several phone calls from the palace asking her to tone down her reports. I think Trish mentioned that. After, I, after she explained to them that her facts were right, those calls have now stopped. After that, Al Jazeera English was the only international channel to get an interview with the president last November. He hadn't done any interviews for a year and he hasn't done any since. And, you know, SBY proudly showed, uh, Cecilia Bambang Udiona proudly showed Step apparently that he was watching Al Jazeera in his office. Um, they were also the only channel going up to West Timor to do stories about famine and starvation there. Um, only now is the Indonesian media covering this story, but they still don't really show the complete picture. Yet the famine is still there and many more children have died. Let me show you that report, um, or just a, maybe a brief part of that report, because I don't want to go completely over time. But I just want to show you, you know, this is a kind of neglected story by the local and international uh, media where children are dying because they don't have enough food in West Timor. This is two and a half year old Joseph Seram. His weight, five and a half kilos. The normal weight for a six month old baby. He's just been brought to the feeding center after a medical team had found him in his village. Joseph's mother explains that the child's daily intake of food is only a little bit of porridge. The family has not enough to eat because there was no harvest this year. Most children here are brought in after their weight has dropped dramatically. Parents usually don't come here by themselves because they feel helpless and ashamed that they are not capable of feeding their own children. This child was brought in when it was only two weeks old. His mother says she has not enough milk to feed So him. after that first she report that Step filed from West Timor, several Indonesian editors called her and she gave them her contacts, but not much happened after that. She thinks that Al Jazeera is quite popular in Indonesia because people can watch it on cable and the satellite providers carry it. But that means that still most people who don't have a dish or cable uh, can see Al Jazeera. Now, Step was saying it would be a great idea to have a local channel carrying Al Jazeera regularly as well, so many more millions can see it. Well, that might become a reality soon. Um, I, I don't know that Drew was aware, but in uh, the, the Philippine All News Channel, ABS CBN News Channel, has taken now a half hour of Al Jazeera live, our 4 p.m. local time uh, bulletin, and it's broadcasting it live in real time. 
it's not even subject to the five minute delay that the Malaysian censors put on us in Malaysia. So people in the Philippines see it before people in Malaysia see it. And uh, Metro TV uh, has apparently expressed interest in a similar deal. So that might well happen soon. And I don't know that CNN or the BBC have anything like that in the region. Now, in Malaysia and Indonesia, it seems our coverage then has somewhat galvanized local television newsrooms. Viewers see the stories, and that's apparently helped local journalists to consider reporting stories that they would not have considered in the past because of self or actual censorship, in a sense empowering the media to test the limits of freedom of expression. Uh, at Al Jazeera English, the commitment is to bear witness to neglected issues and crises and give a voice to the voiceless, but we've also asked for a response for those in power. In this way, we have often incurred the irritation of governments for shedding light on issues they would rather leave in the dark, but we hope that we can ultimately help to improve people's lives, if not by pushing the decision makers to change their policies, then at least by informing everyone better, raising their awareness, and increasing the possibility of constructive dialogue. Rather than being an accidental witness, posting the latest thing to happen and calling it news, like poor Britney Spears being committed, like a car chase filmed from a helicopter or a plane crashing at an air show, we keep asking what's news. Surely it's things that affect people, and the job of the journalist is to shine a light where often there is none. And I think all of these things are tied up, shining a light, reporting on the effects of events on people, understanding how geography influences perspective, and it comes back to the information flow, not reporting on the mundanities, the car chases, the bank robberies, but reporting on the difficult and the complex, reporting on issues which intrude into our comfortable lives. Um, with respect to our hosts, our topic at this conference seems to have an, under, an implied underlying narrative that out there in so-called less developed nations with younger democracies, Al Jazeera English has the opportunity to provide a challenge to the establishments precisely because it is not from those particular countries nor from a Western nation. So I find myself asking why is it that in this country where freedom of expression is supposedly seen as so important, it's enshrined in the Bill of Rights, Al Jazeera is finding it so difficult to get carriage. Could it be that Americans find it too difficult to look when a mirror is held up to the world by a non-Western nation? I very much look forward to the day when a conference like this will be held in Kuala Lumpur entitled The Impact of Al Jazeera English in the United States. Thank you. Can I get the, yeah, okay. Great. Uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Michael and Sue and the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars for having us and, and hosting this important event. I think it's a fantastic time to start talking about the impacts that Al Jazeera English can have. Uh, my specific presentation is going to be a presentation about a small part of the results of a larger project that I'll give you some background on in a second. But the major thesis is that Al Jazeera English's behavior or coverage in Southeast Asia confirms two theories of media power. One is what is formerly known as the CNN effect, which is currently brandished as the Al Jazeera effect. And second is the power of the demonstration effect. I'll explain both those theories in just one moment. But first about the, the project. Uh, when Al Jazeera was launched, a colleague of mine and I, Mohammed El Nawawi, decided that we should endeavor on a larger research project to test whether or not the different approach to international news could actually change the way people saw the world. We hypothesized that the principles behind Al Jazeera English, for instance, bearing witness and giving a voice to the voiceless, reversing the flow of communication, were the same principles that peace journalists, scholars of peace journalism, have been talking about for 20 or 30 years as necessary for solving cultural conflict internationally. We said, why don't we put this to the test and survey international populations with regard to whether or not they consume Al Jazeera English and their perceptions of cultural conflict. Uh, we are doing surveys in five countries, including the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Qatar, uh, with a total sample size of about 600 people who watch Al Jazeera English. We are using four scales to measure levels of cultural, Tolerance, political tolerance, 
cognitive dogmatism, and civic engagement. And we've operationalized those four scales to mean uh, whether or not people are more open to other cultures. Uh, unfortunately, we literally just finished the survey work this morning. My colleague, Mohammed flew back from Toledo, Ohio. That should sound familiar to those who are familiar with Al Jazeera English. It is the largest market in the United States that it is allowed to get uh, Al Jazeera English, the second largest being Burlington, Vermont. We had to go to Toledo, of course, to collect our 100 surveys from the United States because it is difficult to find people outside of Toledo who actually are able to watch Al Jazeera English on a consistent basis. The results I'll be presenting here are based on focus groups we conducted when we were in Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur earlier this year. First, the Al Jazeera effect. Based on the CNN effect, uh, which stated, which was established in the mid-1990s, which stated that media can impact government policies, especially with regard to international conflicts, uh, the Al Jazeera effect has gone through two waves of scholarship. The first one, which was basically saying that Al Jazeera had a tremendous impact on Arab governance, uh, noted, in fact, m many scholars have noted the diplomatic consequences that Al Jazeera has had for the government of Qatar. From there, a second wave of Al Jazeera research has uh, been proposed, which says that Al Jazeera should be used as a metaphor to understand the impact that new media technologies can have on politics and governance. We have uh, decided to test this, this theory with our current focus group study to, say whether, to examine whether or not Al Jazeera English's coverage in Malaysia and Indonesia has impacted politics in those two countries. The reason why uh, the title of my presentation is The Politics of Protest is because media coverage of protest is of exceptional nature. Uh, it has been demonstrated through historical research that media coverage of, of demonstrations or protests has historically been more significant in changing public opinion. Uh, it's called in the literature the demonstration effect and has been attributed to part of the collapse of the Soviet Union as protests emerged towards the end of the Cold War, a trigger effect uh, took place where it sparked democratic change throughout Eastern Europe and even Latin America. Media coverage of protest is of particular importance in the initial framing of protest groups. The initial framing of protest groups. And that's important, especially given the coverage we just saw of the protests in Malaysia. Uh, the frames that the media organizations place on the protests, violent, nonviolent, peaceful, productive, for democracy, for something else, impact the ways in which audience members can identify with those groups, and thus the ways in which media coverage can impact public opinion at large. Uh, the literature has established several examples of the way this framing effect can impact the success or failure of movements, two critical examples being Seattle and the Danish cartoon affairs. The media coverage of both those protests labeled the protesters as violent, and thus those protests largely failed in achieving much significant change. Uh, I don't need to go into too much detail here. Our research in Indonesia and Malaysia focused on interviews with opinion leaders, interviews with local journalists, uh, local newspapers, Al Jazeera English employees themselves, and of course, uh, several focus groups. Uh, we've covered this as well. The Indonesian media environment, I just want to highlight a few things here. Uh, our research indicated that many journalists felt that Indonesia was moving towards democracy way too quickly, that it was a hodgepodge of voices without much consolidation, and that extremist voices, both on the left, the right, up and down, were controlling the media waves in that there was no harmonious, harmonious voice. Uh, one important quote is uh, that, yes? I speak quickly. I also have to condense my uh, presentation. Uh, the level of freedom is moderate, 114th out of all of the nations in the world. And people identify the debate in, amongst the media as many voices. There are many people talking, uh, but there's not much of a consensus about what is going on. Al Jazeera English in Indonesia, they have one bureau, one correspondent, as we just heard about. Uh, their audience, our initial research, and again, this is not based on the surveys, but rather on the focus groups, is that not many people are watching Al Jazeera English as of now. Its main audience is public opinion leaders, uh, about 1.5% of the population speaks English fluently, which limits the number of audience members that can possibly watch Al Jazeera English. And only 6.5% of the population subscribe to paid television services. This is according to local media outlets uh, in Jakarta. The popularity, most people said it's as important as the BBC, but it's much more important than CNN. Impact on local media, local news media still dominate news, the news environment. The reasons for these facts come from our focus groups. Uh, Al Jazeera English is largely associated with its Arabic brand. Uh, people say when they want 
to get news about the Arab world, they would go to Al Jazeera English, but they would not go to Al Jazeera English for news about Asia or Africa, which is, which is uh, a, a problem given that Al Jazeera English's strengths are news in Asia and Africa. It is seen, uh, this focus on Arab news is seen as an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage being that when people want news about Iraq or Afghanistan or is the Israeli situation in Gaza, they go to Al Jazeera English. The downside is that there's an inherent resentment amongst many Indonesians with regard to the Arab world, and so they are suspicious of much of their coverage of uh, the Arab world. It was associated with a depth of journalism. Uh, the imagery, the technology, was credited as significant, significantly better than CNN, for instance, and it was uh, noted as having flat coverage, which is to say that people thought it would be more opinionated People thought it would have more flash, but it was actually more similar to what they see on the BBC. Malaysia, quite different. The Malaysian media environment, which we heard about earlier this morning, uh, is much more strict, and I think that's become clear given the clips we've seen. Uh, Al Jazeera English in Malaysia, uh, obviously they have a broadcasting bureau there. The highlight, and, and we've touched on this, but I want to put it in the context of theories of media power, the highlight was the coverage of the protests in Kuala Lumpur. And these protests really had a tremendous impact, and we, we've measured this a few ways. Uh, the protests were the largest in over a decade. And if you go to YouTube, you can see that this is the seventh most watched clip on Al Jazeera English slash YouTube. Over a quarter of a million people have watched the, the clips we just saw here. Um, I have right here the link to the Minister of Information responding, the, the link we just saw. And the reason why I wanted to show that is because in our focus groups, ev almost everyone, almost unanimously, this was uh, mentioned, referenced, and said it was a national embarrassment to Malaysia. National embarrassment. They said Al Jazeera English had covered the protest well, they, they had done a, a great job, and that the Minister of Information should be out of office. And sure enough, uh, he is. Uh, in terms of its impact on local journalism, we had two different uh, sides of the story. State-based local journalists said Al Jazeera English is going to do what it wants to do. It doesn't matter to us. Uh, Non-state-based uh, journalists changed their mind. The editor-in-chief of the New Straits Times said Al Jazeera English's coverage of the protest changed how we cover sensitive political issues here. Before, we could not show such images or tell such tales of government abuse. Now, if we don't, we will lose our audience to Al Jazeera English. I've told the Minister of Information that, and he understands that things must change. So you see that even if, for instance, uh, local journalists aren't quoting Al Jazeera English, their approach to local issues is changed post the protests. The focus group results were a little bit different in Malaysia than Indonesia. They said it, that Al Jazeera English did not live up to the representation, rep, uh, reputation of Al Jazeera Arabic, but that was a good thing. Similar to Indonesians, the brand of Al Jazeera did not carry as much of a positive weight as maybe, maybe think it did. Coverage of uh, Africa, Pakistan and Myanmar were noted as significantly better than its competitors. Uh, some people actually said there was not enough coverage of the Middle East, uh, but that what they did see was excellent. Um, with regard to the protests, I think I just talked about this, but most people thought that Al Jazeera English's coverage of the protests was excellent and hoped to see more of it. Finally, the Al Jazeera effect in Southeast Asia. Uh, Al Jazeera English lacks a significant audience. I think that um, Given its youth, its relative youth, that can be expected. Also, given its lack of coverage throughout both the countries, that can be expected. Yet, we do think that both the theories we've laid out have been confirmed with the results of the focus groups. Al Jazeera English's coverage of the Indian protests in Kuala Lumpur was a turning point. It impacted local media. Uh, it spread throughout the Malaysian World Wide Web, which is significant because it merges the two waves of Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera effect literature. The first wave was that satellite broadcasting can impact the politics of governments. The second wave was that other new media technologies like the internet can further impact uh, governments and politics. This was an interesting example where not a lot of people saw the original clip of the protest on Al Jazeera English, but it was circulated through the World Wide Web to enhance the overall impact that their coverage had. It turned public opinion against the government and literally changed the course of politics. A few lessons can be drawn from this. Uh, despite the new media technologies, proximity still matters. The difference between Malaysian the Malaysian focus groups and the Indonesian focus groups was significant. Indonesian focus groups uh, thought were jealous of the coverage, the, the, the overall depth of coverage that Kuala Lumpur received and wished they had more correspondence in Jakarta or throughout the islands. Uh, 
what, what this, this is important because we're taught in today's new media age that it doesn't matter where you are because in new media technologies, we can get images of, of anything. Our, our focus groups pointed to a different result, which is that proximity does matter. The fact that the protest took place less than a mile from the office in Kuala Lumpur impacted the way Al Jazeera was able to cover the protests. The second lesson is Al Jazeera's impact can be strongest where it's needed most. What I mean by this is where governments are trying to crack down on public opinion, public voices, uh, democratic protests, that is the strongest place where Al Jazeera can have an impact, which is demonstrated with the Kuala Lumpur example, but also backed up with historical examples of the way media can cover protests in productive ways. The overall audience size is not as important as the quality of coverage. It's not going to matter if not a lot of people are watching the initial coverage. The World Wide Web is widely accessible, and word of mouth spreads good clips like the example we've given here. Uh, personalized first-person focus works. People identified with the first-person focus of Al Jazeera English's journalism. And finally, Al Jazeera English's coverage is best when it's challenging poor governance. And so people were less interested in humanitarian stories that didn't impact local politics. But when governments were called out for abuse or neglect, people really identified with the coverage. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you, the Woodrow Wilson um, Center, for giving me this opportunity to speak about an Indonesian perspective, Al Jazeera English, and the media environment in Indonesia. And for my presentation, I will solely focus on, the, in, on Indonesia. Um, earlier, Professor um, McDaniel had given a thorough overview of Indonesia, but I will um, touch a little bit briefly on Indonesian current media environment. The Indonesian media has been enjoying its greater press freedom since the fall of President Suharto in 1998. The press not only has freedom to write or report, but also the number of new media, both print and electronic, have increased significantly. Nowadays, if you come to Indonesia and you come to any one of the newsstand, you can see it is so colorful, and even at a traffic light stop, you could see the newspaper um, selling magazines, um, offering selection of newspaper and magazine at the traffic lights. You'll notice that they sell not only uh, domestic publication, but also foreign publications such as Cosmopolitan, Bazaar, Reader's Digest, GQ, and even the controversial Playboy magazine. Um, the television viewers are also enjoying the fruits of press freedom by being able to watch varieties of channels and programming. As you can see, the number of national television has also increased from 5 to 11 stations, including the state-owned television, TPRI. The regional television station had exploded to at least 75 stations in the last 10 years, and the number will continue to increase as 218 station operators have applied for operational license. Television channels not only limited to local broadcasts, but also foreign broadcasts, which can be viewed through pay television. Viewers can enjoy tens of foreign channels from CNN and BBC to Italy, Rai Uno, and China, CCTV, as well as Al Jazeera English. Currently, there are five pay TV providers in Indonesia, and five others are recently granted licenses, and seven are still waiting for their license to broadcast. The reform era also gave birth to the first broadcasting law government Indonesia had introduced, that is the law number 32 of the year 2002. The impact of Al Jazeera English um, in Indonesia. Oh, I missed. Okay, I forgot. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, the impact of Al Jazeera English on Indonesian media. At at present, Al Jazeera English has a very little impact on media in Indonesia and the society at large. Al Jazeera first entered Indonesia market exactly a, a year ago, that is March 2007. And presently, there is a lack of awareness about this new channel, and furthermore, there is no advertising of the channel except through word of mouth, including by the um, correspondent staff person. Um, Al Jazeera English penetration is still very low in a country of 234 million, 
the world's fourth largest in size and the most populous Muslim country. Only pay TV subscribers can watch Al Jazeera English. Among five existing pay TV providers, only three of them carry Al Jazeera English, their cable vision in division and Astro TV. The penetration of pay television in Indonesia is less than 2% of the total household that have access to television. My PowerPoint will um, describe more detail on the um, pay television market share in Indonesia. And currently there are 600, 640,000 pay TV subscribers in Indonesia and the penetration of television is 30 million households out of the total 56 million households in the whole Indonesia. And it is about 54% households in Indonesia that have access to televisions. And since there are only three pay TV operators that carry Al Jazeera, that makes it penetration is only 1.3%. It is difficult to measure how many people exactly are watching Al Jazeera English Channel in Indonesia since pay TV programs are not rated by the rating um, companies such as Nielsen Media Research. Furthermore, both domestic and international channels such as Al Jazeera are included in the basic package of uh, cable subscription. And according to um, a colleague, um, he's the director of news at Astro TV, um, acknowledged that uh, the Al Jazeera um, English is, uh, if you compare to CNN and BBC, um, it's the viewers It's a great difference, and maybe it's more uh, in comparison with BBC World, uh, no, uh, with Bloomberg TV or Channels News Asia. And um, furthermore, people that I interviewed for this research acknowledge that Indonesians are still favor of what to watch Western news channels such as CNN and BBC. And although Al Jazeera English can be um, access through the webcast or internet. Again, it is very low if you consider the internet penetration in Indonesia only reaches 25 million people or users or about 10% of the total population, although this number increases significantly every year. And um, most of these internet users in Indonesia are using dial-up internet connection instead of broadband. And as we all know, dial-up is very slow and almost impossible to view the video streaming on media player of, or webcast. And um, in, in 2007, the, broad, the government of Indonesia introduced the new broadcasting regulation to supplement the um, broadcasting law number 32 that deal with programming, monitoring, allocation of frequencies, licensing of broadcast stations, and relaying foreign content. The latter prevents local private radio and television stations from directly relaying foreign broadcast content and confining this content instead to shortwave radio and cable television networks. This also contributes to Al Jazeera English low penetration due to dissemination of Al Jazeera English is limited only to pay TV subscribers. Um, language, is, um, language is also a problem. Um, Okay, I'll skip this one. Uh, oh yeah, uh, language is also a problem um, since English is not commonly used in Indonesia, and um, like most newscasts, Al Jazeera use of English language is proper and formal, and this makes it even more difficult to understand since Indonesians generally understand very little conversational English. Even foreign films like those American Hollywood films shown on movie theaters have Indonesian subtitle. Um, International news is not popular. Free-to-air television such as national and regional televisions usually subscribe to international news wires such as APTN and Reuters. Based on my experience as a news producer, international news is not popular among Indonesian viewers. The rating during interna international news segment usually declines and start to pick up again when the newscast shows domestic news. Even crime stories will dominate the ratings. Proximity also plays a part unless the story involves Indonesian living abroad. Stories such as the domestic workers being abused, raped, or mistreated in foreign countries like Saudi Arabia or, and Malaysia always get a lot of viewers' attention. Also, the 2005 kidnapping of Indonesian TV reporter and cameraman who is also um, a news presenter uh, at Metro TV um, in Iraq got a lot of attention. Indonesian President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono made an appeal for this release 
of Indonesian news crew on Al Jazeera TV. At that time, it was Al Jazeera Arabic. And most recent one is when President Yudhoyono gave a statement on a controversial film Fitna by a Dutch parliamentarian, Gertz Wilders. Indonesian president invited Al Jazeera and another Dutch TV to convey his message. The only times Indonesian local media use footage from Al Jazeera are during the Second Iraq War in 2003. The footages are taken from international news wire that this station subscribed to, such as APTN and Reuters. Usually these footage are used during the first hours when the incidents happen and after that major national Indonesian stations send their reporters and camera person to the location since the station are financially able to afford sending their news crew abroad. Um, one national TV station, uh, that is TV7, even relayed newscasts from Al Jazeera Arabic with simultaneous translation, and it was also followed by other stations like Metro TV. For a time, viewers switched to TV7 because they want to see a different perspective of the Iraq war that, at that time, only Western news channels dominated the stories. Um, television news has never become a superstar, and it can never beat the rating of entertainment programs. In Indonesia, drama series are still gold mines for commercial televisions. And going back to my previous point of international news is not popular. When I was a news producer for a morning news uh, program for Tans TV, it is very, perhaps some of you know how difficult it is to fill in a 90 minute slot live in the morning um, with news items, especially if it is um, very rare to get a fresh news during the graveyard shift, uh, news falling from the skies, with the exception of uh, house fires, homicides, or burglaries. And so what I did, what I did is I dedicated four segments of the 90 minutes news program to international uh, news um, from APTN. And because it's a lot easier since we subscribe. And come Wednesday when um, uh, AC Nielsen distributed the weekly rating, and as the uh, program was broke down into minutes, you can tell those international segments, um, the ratings slide down tremendously, and it started to pick up again um, when comes the domestic news. And also, um, and finally what I did is I cut down into half, and even though the two segments of international segments was filled with much lighter features, international feature stories. And does Al Jazeera have impacts on Indonesian press freedom? Until now, the Indonesian media hasn't been much influenced by Al Jazeera English. Freedom of expression combined with tight competition and reasonable economic growth and stability enable national TV newsroom to invest in their own sources of international news coverage, from sending reporters to major international news to subscribing to international news wires. The September 11 catastrophe and the invasion of Iraq are hard to equal events. If events with an equivalent magnitude would happen, maybe TV newsroom might rely again on foreign broadcasters such as CNN, BBC World, or even Al Jazeera English. However, they would probably turn more towards the Arabic service, especially if the events would have an quote-unquote Islamic versus Western world connotation. They would rely on such sources as long as they don't have it available from their own. And this happens especially in the first hours or first few days of the stories. Again, due to Al Jazeera's low penetration and lack of awareness among Indonesian, Al Jazeera had, had hardly had any impact on the already exist press freedom. Indonesian press freedom is greatly influenced by local media players and it is expressed and reflected through the local media publications and radio and television broadcasts and not by foreign media. So far, there is none of Al Jazeera's English story about Indonesia made headlines in local media, neither an Al Jazeera English story from Indonesia making international headlines on other international news channels like BBC or CNN not having it. Al Jazeera English is following the usual foreign correspondence path that is to read newspaper, monitoring the local media, pitch some stories to the headquarters, and if they are interested, then they make the story. In short, in reporting news about Indonesia, Al Jazeera English is following the local media rather than vice versa. Al Jazeera's English style in covering Indonesian local stories is the same as other international news channels like CNN and BBC World. 
Al Jazeera is using the same approach as other international news media that is of an international standard, and that is what Al Jazeera English is trying to project. Um, touch upon the story on West Timor, the famine. Um, actually, it has been reported to um, in other news media, including Trans TV, the company that I used to work for. Even when I was a planning editor, I sent out a team of um, news crew to the area. And for those who are not familiar with the Indonesian region, eastern part of Indonesia is um, well known, or if you compare to the other region like um, the Java, the western part or uh, central part of Indonesia is very underpoverished and poverty is very common over there. And famine is not only happen in West Timor but also in other parts of eastern part of Indonesia such as in Papua province. And as far as Al Jazeera's coverage on Islam or its treatment of Islam, one can view it depends on how you define treatment of Islam. When Al Jazeera English covers stories about the religion of Islam, they do it like any other responsible media that is balanced and fair, and responsible Indonesian media does it as well. However, when Al Jazeera is English covers the Islamic world, uh, for instance the Middle East, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera English tends to go more towards the victim side, like when it covers the Palestine and Israel conflicts. AGE tries to expose the human side of stories, the suffering and the drama people go through. And this type of approach usually works to attract more viewers to see the other side of the war. Uh, but however, to be fair, other international news channels also do it as well and run similar programs. However, some people that I interviewed um, gave an impression that they do like to watch Al Jazeera English because it can project itself as an alternative media that can understand Asia and Middle East and Islam from a balanced perspective and also AGE is more sensitive to the local audience. Perhaps because Al Jazeera English is headquartered in Doha and KL, they are more exposed to Muslims and therefore have more understanding. Although they are not dogmatic about it, but they are more willing to understand Islam and more able to communicate with the Muslims. From my various interviews uh, in Indonesia for this presentation, the general imp impression is that Al Jazeera English is hardly used as a reference by policymakers. Um, um, that's because they still look up more to more established news channels such as CNN and BBC World. And although one might find it ironic since Indonesians often express anti-Western, but in reality they are still look up Western media for references. One exception is on the more hardline Islamic publications such as Sabili, Suara Muslim, and Hidayatullah magazine. For your imp information, these types of magazines, especially Sabili, were banned during Suharto era, and they are mainly distributed through underground network. And this magazine portray radical Islam and express strong anti-Western sentiment. According to one of the editors that I interviewed, um, uh, he's from this type of magazine, they do use Al Jazeera as one of their sources. And does Al Jazeera has any, have any prospect in Indonesia? Although it is hard to tell, but Al Jazeera English may have a prospect in Indonesia. The fact shows that there is an increased application for pay TV operators licenses, and there is about 150 million potential audience to grab. And moreover, there is no limitation as how many cable operators are allowed to operate in Indonesia as stipulated in broadcast law in the year 2002. And the internet, like I said earlier, the number of internet users are increasing significantly. Another opportunity to expand Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera English coverage is through mobile TV that is becoming increasingly popular. Television, especially free-to-air, is expanding to other forms of output like direct-to-home and mobile TV. And several cellular operators in Indonesia have started offering mobile TV. So this opens up an opportunity of market entry for Al Jazeera English. And to conclude my presentation with expansion of various means of news transmission in Indonesia and the expanding TV market, Al Jazeera English has the prospect to expand its coverage and penetration. However, the same can be said for other news channels, including domestic and other international channels. Therefore, Al Jazeera will continue to face competition to increase its market share as well as influence in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. Marwan, uh, do you have the last? Thank you. <laughs>
last presentation. So I'll try to be as brief as possible since I know I'm the last thing standing between you and the questions I'm sure you're burning to ask. Um, and what I'd like to, um, to do, first of all, thank um, the Wilson Center for inviting me again to come here. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's also a pleasure to be here in the presence of, of friends and colleagues and mentors um, like Holly and, and Drew. And I want to thank, thank Michael um, and Sue for all the, um, the, the hard work to get this going. What I'd like to do, what I was initially asked to do by Michael, is to compare the Al Jazeera English um, channel to Al Jazeera. And for starters, I think for purposes of clarification and for my own peace of mind, there is no such a thing as Al Jazeera International. Um, there's also no such a thing as Al Jazeera Arabic. There's Al Jazeera Channel and there's the Al Jazeera English Channel, okay? And a few other channels that have different names. So it's Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English, not international, not Arabic, just for the purpose of kind of social scientific uh, precision here. Um, so one of the things that, that I thought I would, I would explain, which I think will go a long way in explaining um, some of the issues um, surrounding the relationship between the two channels is look at the environment in which both channels were born. Um, the second um, thing I'd like to, to look at uh, very briefly, again, because of the environment in which the two channels were born, are the institutional identities of the two channels. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure they're siblings. I think they're more like cousins. And um, maybe we can uh, discuss this. Um, and finally, um, focus a little bit on the relationship. So, you know, there are two very difficult things to compare. Um, they were born 10 years apart. Um, Al Jazeera was born in 96, Al Jazeera English in 2006. Um, the, the, the Al Jazeera was born in an environment um, on the cusp of a, a truly radical transformation in the Arabic media sector. Um, 1996, the field was very open. It really had no competitors. And there was NBC, um, the Middle East Broadcasting Center, which was then based in London, um, Saudi owned. It was not a real competitor, so Al Jazeera had time to make mistakes. It had time to create an audience. It was on its own. Um, Al Jazeera English, on the other hand, enters a very competitive field of international news broadcasting um, with a variety of, of, of complications um, that, that I'll talk about in a second. Al Jazeera Arabic targets a regional audience whose first language is Arabic, which allows, um, you know, there's not, not only matters of political and cultural proximity, but, but the language issue, which allows a different bond, a different quote unquote brand loyalty. While Al Jazeera English is targeting a, a global audience, whose second language and most likely will be English, not, not first language, right? And those, those are very important um, differences. And finally, I think one of the very important things is this notion, um, the structure of the two channels are very, very different. I think from um, Trisha's talk, um, from other talks today, other presentations, we know Al Jazeera English is probably, probably the most complex channel a television channel in operation in the world today. It's a, it's, it's, and, 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 and I think that alone as an experiment um, is to be lauded. I think it's, 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 it's truly a, 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 re, a potentially revolutionary experiment to have these, all, all these broadcast centers, to have offices, um, to have um, a head office, which is something that um, some of you in this room would prefer that it didn't exist, but it does, so we'll have to deal with it. Um, so there are similarities, you know, those are some of the differences, but there are similarities. Obviously, the two channels carry the same name, um, approximately, carry the same, um, they are part of the same brand, and most importantly, they are part of the same network, okay? And this is something that goes back to the Arab media environment, and this is very important to understand. A network in the, sense, in the context of the Middle East is not a network in, this, in the context of the U.S. They're two very different things. Um, in the Middle East, there are now three or four dominant networks, television networks, and those are typically, in, in, in industry parlance, they're multi-platform conglomerates. So they are, you know, the NBC group, which has NBC, NBC2, NBC3, which has Al Arabiya, which is Al Jazeera's, um, the main, the original channel's main comp competition. Al Jazeera is such a network, and it is not something that is, that I'm just saying, that the channel itself, um, uh, not too long, not long before the launch of Al Jazeera English, made an announcement, an explicit announcement, that now we are no longer uh, a channel, Kanat in Arabic, but we are a network, Shabaka. And that, that has a lot of repercussions. So that the network has Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera Sports, um, and a couple of other channels, Al Jazeera Children. And it's part of a um, deliberate policy in Qatar to put Qatar on the map. For those of you who have been to Qatar, 
It's literally a speck of sand. Okay? And now if, you, if you're watching the news, you see Qatari initiative there, Qatari initiative here, the Qatar representative is heard at the UN, um, the, 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 the presidential standstill in Lebanon, the Qataris are an effective um, player. Um, this is really disproportionate. Uh, the diplomatic and political influence of the country is absolutely disproportionate to, uh, to its size, to its historical role. It's proportionate to its gas reserves, right? So, so this is something that also needs to, to be understood. Now, so in the Arabic media, in the Arab media environment, um, Al Jazeera is a very distinct channel. It is distinct in so many different ways. Um, uh, the bad ways most of you have heard about, the good ways most of you have not heard about. Um, unlike its main competitor, for instance, Al Arabiya. Um, Al Jazeera has, from the beginning, made it a point to have open mic programs. You know, the live, not only live call in talk shows, but programs such as Minbar Al Jazeera, which is, you know, the Al Jazeera pulpit, best translation, where people just call and vent. Um, this is in a huge contrast to some of the other channels, even the satellite channels in the region, such as Al Arabiya, where there's nearly no live programs. So, so there's a, an institutional decision, a very deliberate decision, to relinquish some control over the script of what goes on the air in order to attract an audience, and partly because a lot of people feel that this is the right thing to do. So that's very, very important. Now, in terms of another thing that this, let me tell you a story. Um, in 1999, when, um, with the with, uh, with war in Kosovo, um, very few Western channels, very few Arab channels could get a reporter in. Al Jazeera had this one reporter, and I'll tell the story very briefly, who tried to get a visa. Al Jazeera does not have um, um, diplomatic, uh, Qatar does not have diplomatic relations with, um, with Yugoslavia. So he went to the Macedonian embassy in Athens, Greece, and uh, the visa fee was $30. He was de denied a visa a couple of times until he uh, increased the, the visa fee to $1,000 and got the visa, drove, uh, went through Macedonia, drove to the border, got into Kosovo, walked into Kosovo with a satellite um, um, news, news gathering and uh, transmission. Basically, he had his own um, transmission unit, walked into flows of refugees, and scooped CNN by about two or three hours, um, um, scooped all kinds of European channels by a day or two. So this is the, this is the kind of, um, at the beginning at least, the first 10 years, these are the kind of people who worked at Al Jazeera, and they were extremely proud of the channel, um, which is why they were a bit, you know, um, not, not necessarily resentful, but apprehensive about this new kid on the block called Al Jazeera English, which is why Al Jazeera English is called Al Jazeera English, not Al Jazeera International, which is a decision that was made just a few days before the launch, right? Uh, because the, the, the fear was, among some employees of the main channel, of the original channel, the older channel, Al Jazeera, was that if we call this new channel Al Jazeera English and we're called Al Jazeera, that will ghettoize us. They'll be the larger, bigger chunk of the brand. But if we call them Al Jazeera English and we're Al Jazeera, it sends a clear message who's, who's the main um, kid on the block. And that, I think, um, goes to the heart of the identity issue that Al Jazeera English faces. Al Jazeera English faces a very tough decision, a very tough situation. Uh, made tough by the fact that it has to walk a tightrope, that you know, it is a global English language channel that has the Al Jazeera logo on it. Um, and if, if you look at the, the, the interviews with the major uh, people who were about to launch Al Jazeera English, you see this ambivalence, right? Um, I, have, I have all kinds of, all kinds of um, interesting quotes um, where Parsons, you know, Nigel Parsons saying something like, we're not completely divorced. What does it mean we're not completely divorced? Does it mean we're partly divorced? Does that mean we're fully married? Does that mean we're... So, so there was an ambivalence because it was necessary to have this ambivalence. Because in, um, especially in the West, especially in North America, there was this ideological litmus test. Are you going to be Bin Laden TV in English? Are you going to be the same Al Jazeera TV translated um, in English? And I think this is really... Um, this is really not fair in terms of uh, a new channel coming in. Um, it's, it creates an impossible um, set of expectations. And I got a sense of this. Um, I did not know this was such a big deal because I usually write on Arab media. Uh, when Al Jazeera English launched, I ended up doing um, a few radio talk shows and the news hour with Jim Lehrer with Dave Marish, who's, who was the, um, the main Washington anchor. And I started getting hate mail for things that I said that I thought were completely reasonable, where, you know, I'm no... 
I haven't been one of the big fans of, of Al Jazeera for various reasons, but I'm not a detractor. I, you know, basic information, basic stuff, and I started getting hate mail. And so this is the kind of ideological environment that the English Channel um, had to work through, which I think you know, created a lot of difficulties for, for, for many people. The other issue is, who, what is your identity as a channel? So you're facing kind of a hostile environment, um, at least in the West. Um, one of, I thought one of the interesting things when, um, when Dave Marish left, uh, one of the interviews he gave, he said, the channel went from being authentically cosmopolitan to being authentic, authentically Middle Eastern. Um, and I know Dave quite well, and I haven't had a chance to ask him what exactly he means, but I think it suggests something, that, that some people feel that the Middle East component in the new channel is too strong. And, and the, the, the proportion of coverage is anywhere between 30 and 40 percent. So, you know, what are, what are some, very briefly, some of the other elements of this, um, of, of the relationship? Um, my understanding from talking to, um, to people who work at both ends, both ends of the spectrum, is that um, the staffs are supposed to cooperate, which obviously creates some issues. You know, some of the staff, some of the major people in the main, um, um, in Al Jazeera, were resentful about the salaries, about the perks that the, the, the newcomers got. Um, it also creates, um, whenever there's a story that is a trap that could lead to possibly very different divergent coverage um, on both channels, then tensions uh, become, become very high. One of the examples that, that I thought I would mention is, for instance, the, um, the teddy bear story, right, about the teddy bear named Muhammad and what, and what it caused. And it's very unfortunate because I really think um, in, in many parts of the Arab world, um, these are kind of easy targets, right, like the Danish cartoons. I mean, it's, it's very easy to whip up hysteria around Danish cartoons as opposed to addressing some, some big fundamental issues. Unfortunately for television, that's demonstrations, um, things being wrecked, that's, that's very attractive footage. So those, those become minefields um, that kind of risk exposing the difficulty of, of integrating two semi-independent channels in, uh, in one network. I'm going to stop. I had a lot more to say, but I'm going to stop here in the interest of time, and I'm sure some of these issues will um, come up again in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marwa. Um, we have 45 minutes for questions, so please uh, just give us your questions, but wait for the microphone. Yes, please. I'm Yuki Yoshikawa at the Raishawa Center, and I have a question by, for any of the panelists. Um, what is the purpose of the Qatar of having the Al Jazeera? And uh, I'm kind of assuming, is it because of, like, rather than the Qatar people doesn't like the CNN and uh, BBC, I think it's more for the, re I'm assuming it's more for the reason for the, <coughs> to, <coughs> sorry, to make the, views of the from the other people to be known to to the world and that would bring me to meet the the second question about is there any plan of the network to have the to be like more multi language like chinese japanese koreans thank you thank you who wants to take this I mean, I can, I can answer the first part of the question. Uh, why do they have it? Because they can. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's one of the issues is it's a, it's a tiny country um, that um, has several issues. One of them is that as a very small country in a very rough neighborhood, it has to be very good friends with the U.S. Being very good friends with the U.S. in that part of the world is a liability, right? Um, so in some ways, Al Jazeera could be seen as, okay, but there are other things we care about, and that balances out different liabilities. But I think most importantly, it, 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 it gives Qatar a disproportionate amount of power and influence over what it is. Um, and the fact that gas prices are what they are, and the fact that they have you know, um, so much gas makes them capable. Some other people, some other um, regimes who have um, that windfall are investing it in much worse things than TV channels, I think. Yeah, yes. and if I can have some input in that. Uh, that shouldn't necessarily detract from the journalistic editorial agenda, which is, and someone was accusing me of being ad hominem a little bit earlier, which is to give voice to the voiceless, to reverse the information flow from the north to the south. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Just a quick addition. I think for the, for the main channel, 
Um, it has not had one agenda. There are two agendas within the channel that have been battling it from the beginning of the channel. And one is a kind of an Islamist agenda close to the Muslim Brotherhood, and another one is a much more secular kind of Arabist um, 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 direction. So just to say that it has one editorial, now it so happens that both of them fall under the giving voice to the voiceless. Mm -hmm. Because in the, in the context of the Arab world, um, regime can get away with, with, you know, with not allowing um, you know, Islamists to say anything, which gave them the power that they have, because out of resentment, that kind of movement grows. And there's, there are plenty of, of studies about this. This is not something that I came up with. Um, and so now you're dealing with forces that can literally challenge these, these countries. That the fact that Al Jazeera gives them voice, you know, I don't like it when I see it. But um, to be rigorous, this is, this is a voice that's heard now that, that, that didn't used to be heard before. I'm not sure whether um, I, I understood you correct, but um, that it helps the country um, to secure their position towards America. Mm -hmm. I think that's a risky um, position, um, just having in mind um, all the debates I have mm -hmm. in State Department and White House, uh, who were really uh, not only um, anti Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. um, they were completely, um, you know, there was a clear policy to not give interviews to Al Jazeera mm -hmm. because there was this clear understanding that Al Jazeera is per se against America. And then we were able to show them that it's actually not the case. Unless you don't give interviews, your voice is not heard. But um, to say that uh, this channel is the guarantee uh, to have America. Uh, stand aside uh, that little um, country, I, I would not buy that that's argument. Not, that's not what I said. What I said was that this is a, the policy of having within a couple of miles the headquarters of this channel and the U.S. base allows Qatar to balance various liabilities in the region. Not, not you know, it does. Um, and if you look at it, it, they do that very, very well. Um, that they are, their defense is guaranteed because Qatar has a Saudi problem as well. Now things are going better than they used to go, than they used to be. But it has, you know, it's 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 a mouse sitting next to an elephant, and it needs the the dinosaur to protect it from the elephant. Just to put it very, uh, Sorry, very simplistic terms. That's there, what the base the does. <laughs> At the same time, there are other, you know, it, they have to contend with with Arab public opinion and all that. And Al Jazeera does a very good job at at expressing various strands within within Arab public opinion. They give voice to people, you know, I wish would not have the kind of um, platform they have, but they do exist. Um, and so I think it, it does allow Qatar to, to have a balancing act politically, definitely. Perhaps we should mention as well the very different audiences, which you, you, you touched on earlier on. Um, Al Jazeera, the original Al Jazeera, obviously speaking to an Arab-speaking audience, Al Jazeera, English obviously has a much wider audience and therefore it's shaped its editorial agenda, the decisions it makes about what stories to cover um, very much on that basis. Um, we talk about how, Al you talked about cousins, another metaphor, um, Al Jazeera is one side, they're two sides of the same coin, they're both trying to reach the same uh, kind of uh, objectives of challenging established narratives of sh shedding light where there is too often is dark. The journey may be different, but we hope that we're reaching the same place. We talk about in in the English Channel. We talk about um, uh, using the heritage of the Al Jazeera mm -hmm. journalists that you mentioned. They're very brave guys who started off at the beginning and bringing it into the English-speaking world. Um, uh, yes, please. Uh, my name is Fawzia Hussain. Um, I'm a Fulbright scholar at the George Washington University. And I have a question for Mr. Schatz. Um, I was just wondering, in your slides I noticed that you uh, mentioned various newspapers that you look at to see if they have referred to Al Jazeera. And for Pakistan, you had mentioned the Nation newspaper. So I was just wondering, um, on what criteria, like what is the criteria for deciding which newspaper you're going to look at to see whether they're referring to Al Jazeera or do you just look at all of them? Um, we were not looking at all of these media. We are picking um, a group of several media per country who are covering different groups of the society. Um, those who are more, if you want to say, conservative or traditionalists, some who are more representing the um, um, tabloid types of uh, media, 
Um, so you have a whole uh, group of different um, media focus and there we analyze every single piece of the news trying to find out uh, whether they are uh, picking up stories from different media, yes or no. Um, question? Yes, please. Uh, the mic is gone. Uh, but I think that raises another question because you're comparing apples with oranges here. You're, you're looking at domestic uh, news media and comparing them with international news media. There is no local, Al Jazeera doesn't have a local news uh, hole to fill. And uh, that's why in your comparison we get a huge difference between the, what you call the Malay newspapers, I'm not quite sure what that was, uh, contrasted with the, uh, the international channels. No, I was, in, in the beginning I tried to, if, um, I tried to um, give an answer whether Al Jazeera English um, has an impact on the Asian media and therefore we had to analyze the Asian media trying to find out whether journalists from Asian newspapers or others were actually picking up stories from either Al Jazeera or BBC or CNN and other networks and um, the result was quite obvious that um, BBC World or BBC News and, and CNN News uh, were picked up ten times more uh, than those stories which were on Al Jazeera in English. But in, late, uh, w in one of your later pie charts, you showed the uh, topic by story topic. Yep. Right. And you showed there was a big difference there. But my point is, local stories will be of different topics than international news stories. That's my only point. Mm. Okay. Yes, please, in the back. Yes, hi, my name is Floriano. I'm a journalist from Brazil, currently uh, APSA Fulbright um, Congressional Fellow here. Um, I came for the second part of the presentation, so I'm not sure if I missed this. Uh, just wanted to know a little bit more about the Al Jazeera's political economy, uh, who finances Al Jazeera, and uh, what what are the revenues and if that affects anyhow the, your editorial uh, coverage or your editorial line? Um, I'd like to add my voice to it. Is it cost effective? Um, um, Al Jazeera English. Uh, I'm sure Marwan can uh, speak to this as well, but um, from what you did miss it a bit earlier, we were talking, we did discuss this question. Um, Al Jazeera is a public broadcasting company that operates under a charter similar to the one that the BBC runs under. It's uh, funded by the Emir of Qatar, by the government of Qatar. Um, well, it's more like BBC then, because the BBC is funded by the um, citizens. Oh, the license. I see what you mean. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, uh, I mean it's uh, by it's by it's funded by the government, effectively the Emir. Um, uh, is it cost effective, you're asking? I don't, um, I don't know very much about the finances, to be honest with you. Perhaps I, Marwan can. I, I seriously doubt it's <coughs> cost effective. Yeah. Um, um, you know, there, there are very few news channels that are really cost effective. If you look at global media conglomerates, even those in the US, it's entertainment that provides the money and news where you, that, that you spend on. So that's, that's, that's uh, I think that's very important to realize. Um, Al Jazeera happens to have uh, a, a gas price that allows the flow of money to continue, though the budget issues are becoming an issue. I think Trish mentioned it. Um, I've talked to uh, people in the Arabic channel um, a while ago, and they say, you know, I've been here for six years, never heard the word budget before. No. They're beginning to hear it that's now. Not. Um, th that's one thing. The other thing, if, if true, quote unquote, real market forces, real market <coughs> mechanisms were to be applied to Al Jazeera, it would be make, making half a billion dollars a year, at least in the first 10 years. But the Saudis uh, led and enforced an economic boycott on the channel. So the only companies in the Middle East that were actually advertising were Qatari companies. Because all the other companies were made to understand if you advertise on this channel, you don't do business in Saudi Arabia. And if you don't do business in Saudi Arabia regionally, you're just not doing business because of the size of the economy. Uh, Trish? I'm sorry, could you just wait for a mic so we can get 
hear what you say and then Trish will... But meanwhile, while the mic is coming, um, just to get it clear, even if BBC is um, not funded directly by the government, uh, the people in Britain have no chance to decide whether they want it or not. It's the same in Germany. Uh, we just have to pay it and we have to pay it <laughs> even if our TV is in the cellar and we are not using it. Well, but BBC has a, a board of uh, councillors who, uh, of it's course, have well. a, a direct link. And, and that was my question, to, to not as uh, to, to see if it was cost effective, but to, to know to what extent uh, or if there is any influence coming from the government, since it's, it's the government that finances Al Jazeera, if there is any Same kind question. of ideological interference think, uh, with yeah. the editorial line. I think that we, uh, we discussed this briefly this, this yeah. morning, um, earlier on. Um, the, uh, in my experience, in Asia, there is no editorial influence whatsoever. Um, I indicated, I think, that I was only ever rung once uh, by someone from the Arab News Desk concerned about a shot that we were running um, showing some naked men at a Hindu festival um, in India. Uh, and there was concern about the taste issue related to that. Um, but there is no editorial line that we have to follow. Now, there are stories that are sensitive, certainly, but that's the case, I think, in every broadcaster I've ever worked with. There are some stories that can be sensitive for which you might refer up. But it would be very rare indeed that, um, uh, it certainly never happened in my time, that um, you know, lines would be changed, scripts would be changed, shots would be changed. And any editor, frankly, worth their salt, uh, if they believed in the story and if it was set up properly, you just wouldn't countenance that at all. I mean, there would be massive, massive argument. Um, just related to the money issue, um, uh, I uh, ran into, shortly before I left Al Jazeera, I ran into someone quite high up in the children's channel, uh, an Arabic gentleman, and we were ha having coffee and having a chat about the woes and travails of the channel. And I asked him if he had any idea how much the Emir pumps into uh, media, and he said, well, funnily enough, he had recently run into the Emir, um, as you do, um, and um, this question was, you know, he said, have you got any idea how much you put in? And the Emir had no idea whatsoever. Um, and this contact estimated that uh, currently he spends about, about $800 million uh, dollars on, uh, on all the channels. Now, I've got no idea if that's a uh, realistic figure or not, but that was the figure uh, that, yeah, that, that, was, that, was being, um, that was being touted about. So is it cost effective? I guess it depends on whether or not you regard that price tag um, as a way of um, cost effective in terms of influence and your place in the world, etc., <coughs> which I think is one of the things we've discussed about, about why, why Qatar, why Al Jazeera, why the EMEA funds it. Uh, yes, in the back, please. It's uh, Sabin Hinden from, and from the State Department in Public Diplomacy. Uh, I have a question uh, more for Veronica and, and Atria. Uh, you mentioned that in Indonesia that you're having a, um, Algeria Desira doesn't have much, uh, much penetration in the market, about 1.3 percent, mm -hmm. and that most of the stories that are focused are, are local, uh, local interest stories. And um, there was also mention that Al Jazeera. Uh, really is trying to get sort of the human interest story uh, out there. And I'm, I'm wondering how much of your uh, coverage is, is on uh, things that are of interest to Indonesians, such as uh, uh, corruption, uh, uh, poverty, um, government influence, and, and religion, and so forth, and, and how sensitive is the editorial staff uh, to, uh, to covering those stories? And, and do you see those stories uh, frequently uh, uh, from, from Al Jazeera for, for that region? Um, I would say yes. Um, I am um, based in Kuala Lumpur, so um, I did consult in some detail with our correspondent, Step Varsid, who we've, met, we've mentioned several times. Uh, she's based in Jakarta. She thinks that she averages about three stories a week out of Indonesia. Many, many of them are about poverty and uh, uh, underdevelopment and about corruption. Um, we are just about to do an Indonesia week as it happens. I haven't seen what's in the plan for that, but we, you know, it's, a, it's a story that we concentrate on um, a lot. But uh, when you say human interest, 
do you, it's not so much features, it's this idea of, of telling stories from the viewpoint of the people involved in them. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, I can say much about the Al Jazeera coverage since I'm based here in the United States for the past two years. So I've just been watching Al Jazeera English intensely in the past two, three weeks because of this presentation. But I do come across stories on um, Indonesia, um, mostly flash news, and also the latest one that I watched was a feature story on the art of deception that was about the, um, mm, uh, the stealing of Indonesian, um, what do you call it, the ark? Uh, in the Borobudur, oh, this uh, seven wonder, uh, the Buddhist temple. Mm -hmm. um, although that was, uh, that news was, uh, uh, very popular in Indonesia because um, it involved um, Suharto's son-in-law, the one who purchased this <laughs> statue from the museum, and the museum was happened to be owned by the uh, Japanese royal family. Uh, but then um, I regret that I didn't watch, um, because usually when you cover stories, as a journalist, you have to cover all sides, like the victims, the responsible, and the neutral. And in this case, um, that particular coverage, like of um, um, the responsible side, which is the Suharto's um, son-in-law. Um, so I would like to hear, um, you know, what was his motive of uh, stealing this? And um, but I do also been in touch with the uh, um, correspondent Steph Hassan, and she has been in Indonesia for I guess more than ten years, and she was a Dutch. Um, correspondent, Dutch television, and of course, being based in Indonesia, foreign journalists have a very close knit um, association, and they have a very good relation um, with the government people and NGOs. And Step is happened to be one of the very closest um, uh, foreign journalists um, with the president of Indonesia currently. That's no wonder, no surprise uh, that she was granted an interview in the past November and no other foreign journalists um, have been granted one-on-one -on -one interview. Yes, please. My name is Helmi Johannes from VOA Indonesian Service. This is more for Veronica, maybe. Again, about the editorial independence of the news centers, uh, such as in Kuala Lumpur or London. Maybe this didn't happen during a treacherous year, but uh, have you got uh, interference or uh, editorial directions from Doha lately? Uh, how, how is it like compared to your experience uh, with the CNN or BBC? Oh, it's, it is much more decentralized than CNN or the BBC, precisely because of the structure that we spoke about. And perhaps we need to talk about, address that a little bit in case some people are not aware of it. Um, the, there is only one feed of Al Jazeera English that goes out, but what we do is we kind of pass the baton from one regional center, for example, Kuala Lumpur does uh, a certain number of hours, six hours, and then we pass the baton on to Doha. And so you see one feed from Doha, uh, and then it moves on to London, and then Washington, and then we pick up from Washington. So they talk about following the sun with the way that we do our coverage. Um, the content uh, in our shows, because as I mentioned earlier, the decentralization is supposed to reflect uh, in-depth local knowledge in Kuala Lumpur, or whatever region you happen to be in, um, will change. So you will for example, uh, we had a, our correspondent Tony Bertley went to the jungles of Laos. I don't know if you're familiar with the story about the Hmong, uh, or uh, ethnic people, uh, many of whom who fought uh, on behalf of the CIA against the communists during the Cold War in Laos and Cambodia. Well, um, when, once the war ended and the communists won, uh, most, many Hmong actually uh, were moved to the United States, but there is a so-called lost tribe, the lost warriors of the CIA, who continue to live in the jungle. There are 5,000 of them, and they have been abandoned. The Laotian government um, rejects them. They say they are drug pushers or something, and they kill women, children, uh, willy-nilly, you know, without, you know, without any kind of... Um, process. Anyway, our correspondent Tony Bertley went there and did 
uh, and it's two hours trek through the jungle to get there, and that was our lead story, plus interview, an interview with a Laotian government official who came to Bangkok to do live interviews with us, plus other analysts from NGOs who dealt with the Hmong issue as well, and that was our lead story. It wasn't in Doha, but, and it wasn't in Washington. Oh, maybe, actually, you may have led with it, actually, Will. I'm not sure. I think, I think you did that week as well because it was, it was distinctive coverage, so we wanted to put it in the lead. And there was no question whatsoever about that from Doha. They didn't say, I, they didn't say you know, no, you must run with a story from the Middle East or anything like that. Um, and to answer your question directly, no, there, were, there has been, in my experience, no editorial interference from Doha. I think the other, because um, we seem to be getting a lot of questions about editorial interference, mm. I think... Um, you know, there is a planning process, you know, that, that um, ha occurs in, in every newsroom around the world. You know, stories are planned out. You don't all of a sudden decide to go to Laos to go to the jungle and trek for two hours or whatever. You know, things are planned out. Mm -hmm. So there's a clear planning process. Everybody knows what everyone else is doing. It's up there on lists. There's huge discussion about it. You have meetings. Doha is aware of what you're doing. Um, the other thing also is that news is fast these days, from when I've been in the industry and from when I bet you've, you've, mm. you began as well. Mm. Um, things happen now. Technology means that it happens at such a pace. So the idea that you know, someone would sit down and say, you know, is that word, should that word be this or should it be that, and we don't like the shot, it just, it just simply does not happen. So there's full disclosure about what we're doing. Everyone knows, and it's all in the planning list and in the system and all the rest of it which does not mean that there are not sensitive stories, mm. but there are sensitive stories in every newsroom around the world, in every newspaper, whatever. So, you know, to have the idea that someone is sitting there, uh, you know, monitoring this and kind of putting their fingers all over it, I, it, it just, it's just not the way that the industry operates. Yeah, and I, actually I should mention, when I say that there's no editorial interference, that's not to say that there's not debate over a story during the planning process that uh, Trish is describing. Um, of course we go through a story, and, I'm, and I, I find it absolutely and utterly encouraging and healthy that there is a debate about stories in a newsroom. That's exactly what should happen, and there is much more of it that goes on in Al Jazeera than does at CNN in Hong Kong, where I worked for five years, or at CNN in Atlanta, where I worked again for five years. Okay, in the back, please. Yeah, Susan Gili again from um, Intermedia Survey Institute. Um, I have a question really, I'm still struggling with Al Jazeera English's sort of branding and positioning strategy because um, building on what Marwan said before, um, Al Jazeera Arabic basically, you know, based on our, my company's actually extensive re audience research during the Middle East in the last decade, it's very clear that Al, Al Jazeera Arabic's success is based uh, um, on the audience's perception that that the station was bold enough to say things that domestic media were not saying, less because of its anti-Western um, stance than because of this, th this sort of, um, again, boldness against domestic Arab media throughout the region. Al so given that, Al Jazeera English, how is its perspective going to differ from other international media in English precisely at a time when other international media in English are really struggling to maintain their audiences. You know, I know whether it's BBC or, or Voice of America or CNN, you know, English language international news is a very tough business to be in, especially when you're trying to have local impact. So, I, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It's no. a big question. Uh, Marwan, please, uh, you know, uh, please, oh, please I, say something. I mean, the only, well, I mean, I think it's one, again, one of those instances as we had earlier on in the session where I wish you could see us. I wish you could see us to see how we're different and to see because we are very different from CNN and BBC. Yes, it's a tough environment, but we are trying to, we are trying to sort of, um, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about being repetitive, but we are trying to give a viewpoint, an alternative viewpoint, the new kid on the block that shows, you know, the, the give voice to, uh, people who normally don't get a look in. So for example, you hear about the, I mentioned the Hmong story. Uh, so for example, um, yesterday I was on board here, I was anchoring out of the DC Bureau and we had a piece by Kristen Salumi who's based up in New York. She did a piece about immigrant workers who are uh, undocumented, uh, many 
of whom are finding themselves forced to take on dangerous labor, and they are uh, suffering more and more injuries. And with the, uh, with the economic downturn going on here and around the world, they are being forced to take jobs that regular workers won't do, and thereby risking injury and even death. So I think that's the kind of story that we will do, but you don't, I don't know that you see that on CNN International or BBC as much. I'm sorry, that's, is that... Just wait for the mic. Yeah. No, the question is because it's in English. Mm. So, I mean, if you had that same broadcast in a local language, so BBC may be in English. Mm. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe it's not doing this, but BBC in the local languages. I mean, that's why they have those two tracks. Or, you know, that, how, how are you going to build an audience in English to have this local, to, you know, have these local voices, but then be talking about it in English? See, as a strategy. I, mean, I, I think I think if you if you would watch the channel, one of the one of the first thing that you see is, in fact, Al Jazeera English reflects the true state of global English, right? So you don't only have a kind of a U.S. Australian uh, um, British accent and the variations within, but you have you know um, somebody who speaks English with a heavily um, accent, you know, with a, with a heavy Arabic accent or with a heavy whatever accent. And so I think in that sense, there's more local resonance with this. Uh, um, it, it, that's one. Two, yes, English is a the global English language news um, industry is extremely competitive. But if you put it in a context, and I don't have, um, maybe Roland has some, some empirical data on this, but my, my anecdotally, Al Jazeera English is doing a lot better with you know, English language news viewers than a lot of the Western channels targeting Arabic speakers and Arabic viewers are doing in, in the Arab world. So I mean, when you cross, when you cross a sphere like that, right? When, when, you, when you're kind of you're negotiating several boundaries politically and culturally and linguistically, the odds are that you know, the odds are against you. Um, and in, in this sense, in a, putting it in a global context, I think they're doing very well. Um, could they do better? Of course. I mean, you know. But if you look at some of the Western channels that are um, doing Arabic news, they're just, they're just not on the radar in most countries. Uh, Roland, do you want to add something to this? Oh, maybe not on that, but I would like to uh, challenge this point that um, there is no editorial um, guidance um, because um, maybe it is easier to talk about a channel which is not involved that personally. Um, let's talk about Al Arabiya. Um, Sure, there is a scissor in the head when you speak with um, the editors-in-chief of Al Arabiya and you ask them why are there so few stories on Saudi Arabia. Um, they smile at you and they say, well, you know, they are funding us. When you ask them why are there are so little stories in, on how expats are treated in Dubai, the same response. It's nothing... Um, Untypical. Um, we have the same um, results in BBC. We have the same results in in German networks. Um, I think it doesn't help to say there is nothing like this going on. If we look at Al Jazeera data, there is uh, hardly any news out of Doha. Um, and um, I think we we get. We <laughs> You know, I'm just coming from Bahrain. Uh, there is a lot going on in these countries, and I would really love to hear more about that. Um, so I think uh, we are not serving ourselves if we just say everything is nice and there is no editorial guideline. If we just read the latest, uh, the latest reports why some, some colleagues are stepping down um, from Al Jazeera English, uh, there are at least some arguments they put on the table. They say things changed with Al Jazeera English, and because these things changed, we are no longer working for Al Jazeera English. So, I mean, I, I agree these are serious issues that have been put on the table, but why is it that with this channel, the focus is on, I mean, think of how many questions we got today. Why does this have to dominate the discussion? Um, influence on editorial decisions happen in all kinds of subtle and unsubtle, direct and indirect ways. Why is it that with this channel, that should be the focus? Um, the, you know, you have qualified people, obviously people who, can, who could have gotten jobs elsewhere if they wanted to, who decided that it's worth to work for that channel. And I don't know much about it except, you know, what I'm sharing. But I think that the discussion with just, there's this 
eye of the needle that are you getting orders from Doha all the time, that that's, that's the main question, I think, I, I think it really shrinks the size of the conversation. I think the conversation is a lot broader. I think most channels, most TV channels, most newscasts in the world are subjected to various degrees of influence. So I think it's a disservice that in this case we focus on that angle so much. The, I just want to add two things. One, the way I think about this editorial independence question is it begs the question of what is a proper news agenda, which is different for every news organization. So just like Marwan was saying, the fact that it's uh, a focus of criticism with regard to Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English uh, raises larger questions about why don't we analyze organizational identity from other big news organizations. I do want to push back on this branding question, though. I think that it's a good question, and we've been fortunate enough to have about 30 interviews with, with Al Jazeera English journalists and, and members of the organization in London, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, and Doha now. And it does seem like there's some serious confusion about what the overall goal of the organization is. Um, you know, it, 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 obviously I think that um, the answers that were given here are, are accurate and authentic, but I'm not sure if the organization has shown those goals clearly, has differentiated itself from the BBC uh, or shown why it's better than local news stations to its audience. There's been a significant lack of advertisement, um, you know, in, in every market. And I think that that is a serious problem for Al Jazeera English right now. Uh, yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stacy McTaggart from the Foreign Press Center at the State Department. Um, my question is related to Susan's and also to the points that you just made, and that is for Southeast Asia in particular, where we saw some of the graphs of English language being at one or, or two percent um, of the population in some countries like Indonesia, et cetera. So moving forward then, what are the goals for the Asia Pacific Bureau of Al Jazeera? What is success for you? Is it having stories out of that region of the world broadcast to the larger English speaking world? Or is it, as you've shown us, Veronica, affecting the local media and perhaps helping them overcome some of the challenges that they have. I mean, where do we want to go in Southeast Asia with the challenges of English-speaking news in that region? Thank you. Um, it's always more gratifying when we have more viewers, and I know that our relatively new distribution head is looking at getting more carriage. In the last six months, we've struck a deal in Singapore and Hong Kong where we didn't before, and I know that you know, and as Will mentioned, he's trying to get more carriage in North America. I think, I think it's important to remember that we are still a very young channel. It's barely a year old. And, you know, as Marwan pointed out, we're, uh, but we're not pioneers. We've had to kind of catch up, or immediately set an effect, uh, an impact uh, in compa that is compared with CNN and BBC who have been around for much, much longer. Um, so I think... At this point, for us, it's getting the stories that we feel are important on air. <laughs> it, is, it is really that simple, and doing it well. Um, second question, who mm. is going to cover the uh, Olympic Games in China? Is it Doha, or is it... Uh, it's KL. It's, it will it's be KL. It will be KL, and it will be staffed out of our... Uh, out of KL and out of Beijing, the people uh, who live there. I think there might may be some uh, other inputs coming in, but I don't think that's been finalized yet. Or if it has, I don't know about it. So the it. focus, the headquarter for covering this is going to be Al Jazeera Far East and not uh, Al Jazeera. But there may be supplementary staff that go to Beijing to cover that, so you may get different viewpoints. I mean, I should mention that actually I was here a couple of months ago to, do, uh, to cover Super Tuesday, so Al Jazeera is a company that surprisingly, <laughs> for someone like me who's worked in other companies, you know, they, they think it's important to have other perspectives, like somebody who's based in Southeast Asia coming and having a look at what's going on in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think I should uh, also address Roland, I'm sorry, uh, uh, there was an, that other co question came up and I wanted to talk, you, talking about the, um, you, you were talking about um, how much news comes out of Qatar. Um, and this, how we cover Gulf states. We did actually do, uh, and it was very sensitive among the network, I think they walked through this story and through the series over and over again, a piece about uh, immigrant labor, particularly in view of the Human Rights Watch report that came out that alleged uh, you know, uh, pervasive abuse, actually, of um, 
uh, migrant labor, and we did do it. There were three, uh, there were, I think, three or four uh, pieces to that series. Um, and I don't mean to put down my wonderful employers in Qatar, but as I say, we have an international market, and it's, the stories out of Qatar are evaluated in the same way that any story out of anywhere is is evaluated, and sometimes we have stories and sometimes we don't. And 